well, as you're being seated, I must say it's with incredibly mixed emotions that we leave our study in Psalm 23. I don't know about you all, but it just really ministered to me and reflecting on the fact that the Lord is shepherding me constantly and then thinking about all that he provides, rest, refreshment, restoration, restraint, protection, provisions, eternal perspective and promises so that we could end that psalm with surely or only goodness and mercy will follow me. How often? All the days of my life, and I will dwell where? In the house of the Lord forever. That is such an incredible psalm, isn't it? Who wouldn't want the Lord as your shepherd if he does all that? I mean, just think about that for a moment. All that he does is our shepherd. But some might well ask, who is this Lord, this Yahweh, who I can have as my shepherd and How can I know for sure that I will dwell in his house forever? Those are great questions. And those are some of the questions that the Apostle John answers in his little letter that we call 1 John. So if you would turn there to 1 John chapter 2. It's been a couple of months, so I'll remind you that John wrote this letter to a group of believers who were being lied to by false teachers. They were being told that what John had taught them wasn't enough. They needed more. And he writes to them, and in chapter 1, verse 4, he says he wants them to have the fullness of joy that he has. Isn't that a great thing to want for someone? How many of you want to be joyful? Could you show me? I mean, really, I I don't want just your hand. What about your face? Show me with your face you really want to be joyful. Really? And that's what John said, I want you to be joyful. Well, where does that joy come from? It comes from knowing, being absolutely 100% sure that you have a relationship with God that will go on and on and on forever. That assurance of salvation is a precious gift. And so in chapter 5, verse 13, John says, that's why I'm writing. I want you to know that because you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. Not you might have, not that you will have, but you what? Presently have eternal life. And so that's why he writes. Well, to drive that home so the people can know for sure that they really are saved, that this gospel has transformed them, that the Holy Spirit is in them, he gives a series of tests. Three cycles, and each cycle has three tests. There's a moral test, there's a social test, and a doctrinal test. We covered the moral test initially in chapter one, and then we went on to the doctrinal test, or the social test, and now we're in the doctrinal test. And some people might ask, Paul, why is doctrine so important? I mean, really, what difference does it make what you believe? Well, fascinatingly enough, a organization, the Arizona Christian University Cultural Research Center, did a survey just recently of a 1,000 pastors across the U.S., senior pastors, and they asked them these major questions. One-third of senior pastors believe good people can earn their way to heaven. Does that shock you? No wonder our culture believes that. Asked another question. Over a third believe the Holy Spirit is not a person, but simply a symbol of God's power. 39% of specifically evangelical pastors believe there is no absolute moral truth and that each individual must determine their own truth. That shocks me. There was one more. Well, there was actually several more, but one I wanted to share with you. 37% said having faith in general is more important than in what you have faith or in whom you have faith. Do you get that? So as long as you have faith, that's enough. That was evangelical pastors. You might say, what's an evangelical? That's a really good question. We, we used to know what an evangelical was, but apparently it doesn't mean that anymore. Actually, the term evangelical was first coined by Martin Luther hundreds of years ago. 
He took the equivalent Latin word for the Greek word euangelion, the Greek word euangelion, which means gospel or good news. He took that word from the Latin term and it became the equivalent of evangelical. And it described people who believed that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ was the only thing that could save people. And therefore, everybody in the world needed to hear this gospel. Most evangelicals took it a step further because, as you know, Martin Luther said that that then was Protestant churches only. Because he said that only the Protestant churches believe the true biblical gospel, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. So that would be the gospel as understood by evangelicals. They then added another critical element with the uh, reformers and said it is also a firm belief in the scripture alone as God's inerrant, inspired, authoritative truth. That's what evangelicals were for centuries until the last 50 years. And it has just gone off a cliff so that we have those kinds of results. It breaks my heart. One man well said, a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. If pastors don't know what they believe, what in the world are their congregations going to believe? It's a critical issue. But the Bible is emphatically clear on these doctrinal issues. There is no hesitation, there's no stutter. In fact, King David proclaimed it in Psalm 22, 23, and 24, that it was the Lord Yahweh alone who was his shepherd. Good shepherd, chapter tw Psalm 22, that died on the cross for his sins. Great shepherd, Psalm 23, that shepherded him all the way through his life. And coming chief shepherd, Psalm 24, who was coming back as king. In Psalm 22, the shepherd was the sheep. He was the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Psalm 23, he's the shepherd who walks with us everywhere we go and leads us to the eternal home. And in Psalm 24, he's the soon returning king, the sovereign. David understood that. In fact, Old Testament people understood that. If they read the Old Covenant, they fully understand that God promised a Messiah who would come and suffer and die as the payment for our penalties, as our substitute. He would be buried, he would rise from the dead three days later, and then he would go back to heaven and rule and reign until he returns to establish his kingdom here on earth. That was understood. If you read the Old Testament, you understood that. So Everything they did by faith looked forward to that day. The good news was the Messiah's coming, and we're trusting in him yet future. The good news for us is we get to look back on that day and know 100% for sure it is finished. This is what is understood here, but it breaks my heart. So many people don't have that doctrinal clarity. So as we've been looking at this, we looked at the moral test, the social test, and now we're in the midst of the doctrinal test. In chapter 2, verses 18 through 27, we have 10 verses that has three doctrinal tests within it that reveal who the true Christians are and who the false Christians are. Key word, abide. The first thing we find out about true Christians is they joyfully abide in a biblical church. They joyfully abide in a biblical church. They actively engage in a local church that hangs on to the biblical gospel. And they will give their lives to that and to that ministry and to advancing its cause. Those who depart from biblical churches and head off to something else, he says in verse 19, they went out from us because they were not of us. They were never of us. Jesus will say to them in Matthew 7, depart from me, I never knew you. It wasn't that they were his for a while and then departed. They never were his. And so that's the distinction there. Biblical Christians abide in biblical churches. 
True Christians also, secondly, we've been looking at, they joyfully abide in the biblical gospel. And that's verses 20 through 25 that we've been looking at. We saw initially the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that opens our eyes to understand that gospel and to respond to that gospel by confessing our sins, repenting, and trusting in Christ alone. It's the Holy Spirit who enables us to understand that truth. The Holy Spirit, a person, the third person of the Trinity. And when we know the true gospel, it's easier to recognize the false gospel of, secondly, the Antichrist. In verses 22 and 23, he brings him up. He is not simply against Christ, anti. He is a replacement for Christ. He is instead of. And so you will have these false teachers who will come along. They will even claim to be Christ, but they will lead you away from the true person and work of Jesus. That's what we've been looking at in verses 22 and 23. We noted the false Christian. Here is their confession. Jesus is not the Christ. So how do you know somebody is not truly a Christian? They will say Jesus is not the Christ. That's what they confess. In other words, they deny the person and work of Jesus. Jesus, his person, Christ, his work as Messiah. And when you deny those, if you either say that Jesus is not fully God and fully man in his person, if you deny the fact that he was sinless, then you're not truly a Christian. Or if you deny his work of being the substitute who dies on the cross for our sins, rises from the dead, conquers sin and death, and offers us a free gift of eternal life, if you claim that what Jesus did is not enough, that you need to add your own works, your own religious stuff, your own efforts, whatever that might be, if you believe that, John says you're not a Christian. Because Christians believe in Jesus Christ, what's the next key word? Alone alone. And so that's what we were looking at so far. We left off there about two months ago. So, you're, you're, well, I was gone three of those weeks. Come on, give me a break. So why is this doctrine about Jesus the Messiah so important? As these pastors said, isn't it enough that they believe something? They have faith, right? And the answer is no, that's not enough. The unbiblical confession of the Antichrist produces eternally negative consequences. And I'm going to highlight these relatively quickly, but the first consequence is anybody who denies that Jesus is the Christ is the liar. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Notice the, art, the definite article, the a lot of people are liars. A lot of people tell lies. They, they want to classify them as white lies and this lie and that lie. But John is saying there is the lie that is the worst lie ever in the history of mankind. And that would be the lie that Jesus is not the Christ. Now, this doesn't always mean it's intentional. There are well-meaning religious people in different religions around the world and in cults who are severely deceived and misled, but they are deathly wrong. And they are proclaiming the lie. Now what John is saying is their confession is a lie, their claim to know God is a lie, their gospel is a lie. And no matter how religious they may be, they do not know God. God is not their father, or as Jesus even told the religious Jews of his day who did not believe in him in John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil. So they are not of God. They might be religious. They might be even better than you in certain aspects of their life as far as the way they treat others, but they are the liar. And they are promoting the lies of the father of lies, the devil. Now, there's a commentator named John Phillips who wrote an extended thing in response to this, and I thought it was brilliant. And so I want to read this to you and just drive home this reality of the lie. Listen to what he said. Some lies are mere factual errors, but other lies reveal the utter rot and decay of the innermost soul. The greatest fact in the history of the universe is that the great, eternal, uncreated, self-existing, second person of the Godhead entered into human life by way of a virgin's womb at a place called Bethlehem nigh on 2,000 years ago. It is a lie of lies to deny that. 
The greatest fact in the history of our planet is that the living God, creator of the universe, Lord of all the galaxies of space, was encompassed within the span of a virgin's womb and was born as a man among men. It is a lie of lies to deny that. It is the greatest truth in all the annals of time and eternity that God, having become man and robed himself with human flesh, lived a sinless life in a sin-cursed world, that he lived as no one else has lived, that never man spake like this man, that he went about doing good, that no one, not even his bitterest foe, was ever able to accuse him of sin, that he was pronounced guiltless and sinless by a Roman governor and dying thief alike. It is a lie of lies to deny that. It is the greatest truth of all time that this one whom angels worshipped, who could have summoned a dozen angel legions to put an end to all his foes, who had himself the power to turn water into wine, the power to multiply a little lad's lunch into a banquet for 10,000, the power to still the surging seas, to cleanse lepers, and to raise the very dead. That very one. That very one submitted to the horrors of death upon a cross. It is a lie of lies to deny that. It is the most wondrous, glorious truth in the Word of God that he was not only sinless and faultless, but holy. Holy as God is holy, yet he bare our sins in his own body on the tree. He died the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. More, he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It is a lie of lies to deny that. It is the grandest truth ever to excite the interest and curiosity of the angels that this all-glorious one not only died as a victor with the shout of a conqueror on his lips, but he sovereignly dismissed his own spirit. Not only was he buried, not only was no taint of corruption or decay allowed to touch his sleeping form, but he arose in triumph over sin, death, and the grave. It is a lie of lies to deny that. It's the most glorious truth ever proclaimed on earth and in heaven that this same Jesus, Son of Man and Son of God, both Lord and Christ, arose bodily from the tomb. And still more, in that same body, he ascended on high, entered into heaven, and sat down on the throne of God at the right hand of the majesty on high, and that he sits there in a human body, God over all, blessed forevermore. It is a lie of lies to deny that. It is the grandest truth on mortal tongue and the grandest truth that angels ever sung, that he is now not only our great high priest and our advocate with the Father, but he is coming again, coming to reign on earth in the very scene of his rejection. All creation is waiting on tiptoe, anticipating that day. A vast biblical eschatology anticipates that day. I will come again, he said. He will so come in like manner as you have seen him go, said the angels to the astonished disciples on Olivet's brow. And what John is saying, if someone confesses anything contrary to that, they are the liar. My friends, how many liars are there in the world? Well-meaning. They might not even have any idea that they're lying, that they're spreading the greatest lie in the history of mankind. So one of the consequences of not confessing Jesus is you are the liar. Secondly, you are the Antichrist. He says this is the Antichrist. Now he's not meaning the final Antichrist, but he is meaning one who comes in the spirit of the Antichrist, who conveys false truth, who denies the personal work of Jesus Christ, and represents the Antichrist. And just as the devil empowers the future Antichrist, the devil is also motivating and empowering these people to communicate their lies. They're not for Christ, they're against Christ, they're replacing Christ. In 2 John, he brings this up again in verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So if you do not confess Jesus Christ as Lord, if you say he's not the Christ, then you are the liar and the antichrist. Thirdly, you deny the true God. This is the one who denies the father and his son. Now, there's a lot of people, for example, in Islam, where they will say, well, no, God is God and he has no son. John would say, if you say that, you do not know God. Just think of a billion people around this planet that are probably more dedicated in many ways than we are, 
who are headed to hell because they deny the Son. Does that break your heart? Make you want to go reach them? You know, so often I hear of people looking down their noses at folks who are caught up in this instead of looking at them with compassion and a broken heart, crying out to God for their salvation, looking for ways to befriend them and show them the reality of the true gospel. That's what they need. And they're coming to our nation by the thousands and thousands. Oh, what a privilege we have to tell them the truth. They don't know God. See, God himself declared that Jesus was his son. Remember at his baptism in Matthew 3? This is my beloved son, listen to him. Same thing in Matthew 17 at his transfiguration when he was on the mountain with his three disciples and they they saw him in his glory and, and again the cloud came and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And when all of a sudden the cloud cleared, only Jesus was standing there. The others were gone, it was just him. We also have in Romans 1, 4, at his resurrection, the Bible declares that he was declared the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. God the Father declares Jesus his Son over and over and over again in the Scripture. And yet in 1 John 5, 9 and 10, we'll get there sometime this century. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. This is God's testimony. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a what? A liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. We'll look at that in great detail one of these days. But God himself has said, Jesus is my one and only son. And if you deny that, you're calling God a liar. By the way, that has implications for the Trinity. Because the doctrine of the Trinity that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all equal. They are all eternal God. They all have the same attributes. God the Father hierarchically has a role and responsibility above the Son and the Spirit. They have different roles and functions. There is submission, but it is the Godhead, the three persons in one God that the Bible makes so clear. If you deny that, you do not know God. That's what John is saying. The fourth and eternally deadly consequence of confessing that Jesus is not the Christ is fourthly, they do not have a relationship with God. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. Think about our dear Jewish friends around the world who ever since the first century, many have said that Jesus is not God the Son. There is no Father and Son. There is just one God. They don't even understand their own scripture. But by denying the Son, they deny the Father. Think about that. John 5, 23. So that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. John 8, 19. So they were saying to him, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. It's enough for us. Jesus said, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Let this sink in for a moment. It is impossible to know God apart from Christ. If you deny that Jesus is the Christ, you cannot go to heaven. You do not know God. Doesn't matter what you believe. Doesn't matter how fervently you believe. Doesn't matter how sincerely you believe. You believe in something that has no power to save. It's a demonic faith. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's what John is saying. David Allen in his commentary said it this way. Many people say that we all worship the same God. We just disagree about Jesus. John speedily puts that error to rest. To deny the Son is ipso facto to deny the Father. No matter what your religion, if you deny the deity of Christ, don't tell me you worship the true God because John says you don't. You can't choose God and reject Jesus. 
Since God has revealed himself through his son Jesus, it is obvious that if you deny the son, you are denying the father as well. You cannot believe in God and not believe in Jesus. That's John's point. Well, praise God the apostle John doesn't leave us there on that negative note. He moves on from there, and he goes on from those eternally catastrophic consequences, and now contrast that, contrast the false Christian with the true Christian in verse 23b. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. You know what that makes me want to say? Hallelujah! Right? Praise God we can have a relationship with him through his Son. See, the true Christian is the polar opposite of the false Christian. And then in a form of what's called Semitic parallelism, John takes what the false Christian said and contrasts that with what the true Christian says so you can see it. So I've got a little chart I created here. On the negative side, do we have that? There you go. On the negative side, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. On the positive side, the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Parallels. Contrasting, but parallels. What's the key issue? Deny or confess, and then what? The Son. That's the issue. What you do with the Son determines your eternal destiny, period. Nothing else matters. Well, that simplifies life and religion, doesn't it? Amen. See, if you deny the Son, you're eternally dead. You will spend eternity in hell. If you confess the Son, you not only get the Son, you get the Father too, and you get eternal life. Oh, what a glorious gift. And so that's what he says here. What is the confession? I just want to make four quick observations because there's things in this confession we could miss that I think are critical to understand. The first thing he says is the one who confesses. What's the big deal there? Confession is individual. It's personal. There's no group plan to heaven. You can't jump on the British Bible Fellowship bus and just go because somebody else who is driving knows the Lord. It doesn't work that way. Every individual person must personally confess Jesus as their Christ, their Savior, their Lord. It starts there. Every individual, repent and confess. Secondly, my observation is he says the one who confesses. That Greek word means to say the same thing that God says. Well, God says Jesus is the Christ. God says the Son is sinless. God says he is your only hope. God says that his death, burial, and resurrection is all that you need. God says that he's coming back someday and he will be king of kings and lord of lords and you must know him to enter his kingdom. That's what God says. Do you confess the same thing? And by the way, the one who confesses refers to public confession. There's no closet Christians. You know, you know there's some people, they're, they're Christians, and it's like only their hairdresser knows for sure. And I got to tell you, when I first became a Christian in high school, I was a weak Christian, trust me. And I remember someone told me I was supposed to pray, so I would sit there in the, in the cafeteria at lunch with my cheeseburger, and I'd look around and I'm afraid, oh man, if someone sees me pray, I'm going to get ridiculed. So I would drop my napkin on the ground, and as I was picking it up, I'd say, Lord, thank you for this food. So nobody would know I was praying. I was a secret service Christian, a CIA Christian. No, 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 no. The one who publicly, openly confesses, Jesus is my Christ. He is my Lord and Savior. I follow him. That one is saved. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. That's the exact same Greek construction as 1 John 2, 22 and 23. Confess or deny is what gets you in or out. Third observation, this word is present tense, so it's an ongoing confession. It isn't enough that you confessed back when you were six years old that you believed in Jesus and prayed a prayer. This is an ongoing confession. What does that look like? The beginning of that, the first confession we call baptism. 
Baptism is when you publicly proclaim, I identify fully with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. I trust in that alone. There is nothing I can add to. I needed to be cleansed. My conscience was defiled. I needed to be washed clean, and only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus can do that. Are you with me so far? So you start the Christian life by a public baptism. That's why it's critical that it's public. Others ought to be watching, and quite frankly, preferably even a lot of unsaved people, so that you are proclaiming to the church, church, I identify with you, and we corporately testify to all of you, Jesus is the only one who can change lives. So you start there, but it keeps going with the Lord's Supper. Every time you partake of the Lord's Supper, it's a doctrinal test. What do I believe in that gains me eternal life? When you partake of the bread and the cup, you are saying it is Jesus and Jesus alone and his finished work on the cross is the only way I have access to God, period. It's not me, it's not my works, it's not church attendance, none of that. Are you with me so far? So this is an ongoing confession, starts with baptism, continues the rest of your life through active involvement in the church and partaking of the Lord's Supper as a testimony to the world. But then thirdly, it is also your personal testimony. We have that modeled for us all through the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, at least on five different occasions in the New Testament, gives his personal testimony. He does it in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. Three different settings, three different key leaders, and there's this public testimony of his saving faith. Then you go to Philippians chapter 3, there's another testimony. You go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, there's another testimony over and over and over. I am saved entirely by Jesus and Jesus alone. And that ongoing testimony is our privilege. And those who do that are those who have eternal life. But one more observation on that point. It's confessing Jesus right now as Lord of your life. It's not enough to say he's my Savior. Jesus, you can't divide him. You know, when you look at the different offices, and by the way, our understanding of three branches of government, do you know why that is, theoretically? We have our legislative, we have our judicial, and we have our executive branch. Do you know why we have those? It's called the separation of what? Powers, because men are corrupt. And power corrupts absolutely. So we we have to have three separate branches to control. Jesus Christ is all three. And when he comes back, he will be all three. He will be the one who has the laws. He will be the one who judges right from wrong, and he will be the one that rules and reigns. And so that is who he is. When someone says he's my Lord, but not my, or he's my Savior, but not my Lord, they're saying, I, I, I want you as priest, but not king. You can't divide him. He is prophet, priest, and king. Am I making sense here? He is all three. He always has been. He always will be. You can't take a piece of him. You have to trust in Christ all of Christ. And so he must be your Lord. As Romans 10, Paul writes that great doctrinal treatise, and he says, but if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. I confess that Jesus is what? Lord, and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. For with a heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. This is the same gospel for everybody. The Lord is Lord of all. And whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And the apostle Paul gave the shortest answer ever in the history of mankind. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It doesn't say believe on the Savior. Believe on the Lord. See, the problem is we're going our own way like sheep going astray. We are heading off into sin, doing whatever we want to do. And Jesus came to save us from sin, from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and someday from the presence of sin. We must turn from sin and living life our way and say, Jesus, I now follow you. You make the shots. It's what you want. You're my king. You're my savior. The person who confesses that is saved. One more thing. The person who confesses the son. The son. How many 
sons of God are there? There's one. Now, we all can be adopted into the family and become children of God, but Jesus is by nature the Son of God. And true Christians publicly, continuously pass this doctrinal test by saying, Jesus and Jesus alone is my Lord and Savior. What are the consequences of that confession? Isn't that a great question? Well, first of all, anybody who makes that question speaks truth, because you're not a liar. You affirm what God says. Anybody who makes that confession is a little Christ, and by the way, that's what the word Christian means. Christian means little Christ. You know that? If you are a Christian, you're a little Christ. You are representing him. You are running around to be like him in this world and to share his values, his plan, his kingdom, his salvation. You are a little Christ. Thirdly, you affirm the true God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And fourthly, you have a relationship with God as Father. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. 1 John 4, 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Isn't that a great promise? You confess Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of mankind, you have a relationship with God that no one can ever break, as Jimmy read to us from Romans 8. And by the way, since God is your Father through the gospel of Jesus, you have all the benefits that come from that. Romans 8, you're adopted into his forever family. Matthew 6, you need never, ever, ever have anxiety again. Say what? Because of Psalm 23, Matthew 6 describes how your father cares for you. He knows the numbers of hair on your head. Or Tom, the numbers of hair you don't have on your head. Either way, (laughs) right? He knows. He knows how many have fallen off today. He knows how many were left in the shower. He knows everything about you. He knows what you need before you need it. And he, as he provides for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, he will provide for you. Amen? So therefore, not worrying about that, we can seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and have lives that count for eternity. That's amazing, isn't it? What a blessing. Hebrews 4, we can come into his presence 24-7 with confidence through Jesus and receive mercy and help in time of need. James 1, 5, you can come to him when you're in any trial, any time, and ask for wisdom, and he promises he will lavish it upon you. And John chapter 10, you can know for sure that he holds you in his hands, and nobody can get you out of there. What a blessing through a simple confession of doctrinal truth, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is my Christ. Well, John moves on from there, and just real quick to wrap this up. True Christians joyfully abide in the biblical gospel because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They recognize the Antichrist lies. They believe in the truth that the Father has given us. And thirdly, then, John gives them the appeal. The anointing, the Antichrist, the appeal. And the appeal is this. Abide. Abide in that gospel. Stick with that gospel. Don't look for another gospel. Remain with that gospel. He says it this way, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. And I call this perseverance in verse 24. The word that refers to the gospel message. Let that gospel of Jesus Christ that you heard from me in the beginning when you first got saved be the only gospel message you will ever need. There is nothing to add to it. There's people who come along all the time. I've had some people knock on my door and they don't normally come back. But anyway, they they come initially and they'll share things like, oh, have you heard about the mother God? I go, excuse me? Yeah, I have heard about the mother God. And by the way, your understanding of Revelation 19 is not true and on and on and on we can go. But you can help them identify biblically they have been led into a cult that is trying to take away from the person and work of Jesus Christ. This happens all the time. Constantly you hear people like that. And so John is saying, when these liars come to you that he's writing about in this book, and they will come, are there a lot of false teachers in the world? And they have false gospels right and left. When they come and they try to tell you that old time religion is not good enough, oh, you can sing the song, can't you? Give me that old time religion. It's what? 
It's good enough for me. In fact, it's the only good message in the world. There is no other good news, period, flat, final. Anything that tells you you have to earn your way to heaven is bad news. Good news, God paid in full. Bad news, you have to add anything to that. And that's what the lie is out there. So this perseverance to stick with it, to not be those that depart from us because they were never really of us, to not supposedly believe in the past and then at some point stop believing. Do you know people like that? Made a profession of faith at one time and now they are as carnal as a carrot. And if you looked at them, you would never ever know there was one bit of fruit in their life whatsoever because they are not saved. What's the problem? They don't believe when? Now. Faith is constantly now. You hear what I'm saying? Think about that. Let that settle. See, I have people who ask me, hey, Pastor, I don't know if I'm saved because somebody said, I, I, I need to know it for sure the day I came to saving faith. I need to be able to pinpoint that day on the calendar and I can't. I don't know what that day is. You know what I say to them? Do you believe right now? Well, Yeah. So right now, you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've confessed your sin, repented. You trust him right now. Yes. Then guess what? You are what? Saved. And you can have an absolute assurance of that because Jesus says through John the Apostle here that if that abides in you, you are saved. You are. Then he says, uh, not only does he have that perseverance, but Here's two promises. We'll end with this. I love this. The first promise is eternal security. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also, what's the next word? Will abide in the Son and in the Father. That's a promise. You will. If that gospel is in you and you trust in that alone, you are guaranteed a place in heaven forever. Awesome, isn't that? perseverance of the saints, some call it preservation of the saints, some call it eternal security. If you truly believe, you are going to be forever with the Lord. Why is that? Because you're protected by the power of God. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of who? God, through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You If you believe in Jesus, you are protected by God's power and nothing can harm you. Don't be tempted by false gospels. But there's a second promise. Not only eternal security, and I'll just end with this, eternal life. You say, what? Eternal life is a promise. Verse 25, this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. The Greek text literally says this because it repeats this promise twice. This is the promise which he himself promised to us and that promise is eternal life. Is that a promise? Yeah. He's, he's, he's like, hey, do I have your attention? My promise is you confess Jesus is a Christ, you have eternal life. You say, so wait a minute. So is that quantity? You mean I'm going to live forever? No, no, he's not talking about quantity there. Why not? Because everybody's going to live forever. Did you know that? People who talk about annihilation, they're, they're dead wrong. Everyone will live forever. It's just a matter of where. Eternal death is when you're separated from the goodness, the love, and the grace of God. Are you separated from God's presence in hell? No, because God's everywhere. And God's wrath will be in hell. Eternal life is in the presence of your gracious Father who will love you and take care of you forever. Oh, what a glorious truth. It's not just quantity. Yes, we all have eternal life quantity-wise, He's talking about a quality of life. The moment you confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior, you inherited an eternally, infinitely different quality of life than you had before. 
you have a eternal relationship with God. Jesus said it this way in John 17 in his high priestly prayer in verse three. He says, Father, return me to the glory which I ever had with you before the world was. And he says, and he said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What is that quality of life? It's a relationship with God. Restored, reconciled, his power, his presence, his love, his grace, his leading, his guidance, all that Psalm 23 promised, all of that. 1 John 5, 11, the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. 1 John 5, 20, and we know that the son of God has come and given us this understanding. We may know him who is true. We are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. What is eternal life? It's a relationship with God. It is having a relationship with Jesus Christ and the quality of your life is radically transformed because he came that you might have life and have it abundantly. He wants you right now. You say, well, I can't wait till I have eternal life. You already have it. Right now you're a child of God. Right now you have a divine nature dwelling inside of you by God's grace. Right now the Holy Spirit is in you. Right now you have a quality of life. You can wake up with a smile on your face. And I like to say to people, don't have a good day, have a God day, right? You wake up every day and God is there and you have a relationship with him and nothing will ever change that and he's indwelling you and he's empowering you and you have everything he could possibly give you. The quality of your life is what everybody else ought to be jealous of. Because you walk differently, you smile differently, you live differently, you love differently, because you've got a new eternal life in you. And that life's just gonna get better and better and better. Now someday we'll be glorified, then it's really gonna be awesome. I mean, imagine eating angel food cake and never gaining a pound. It's gonna be cool. (laughs) How do I get all that? Believe. Believe and confess. So let me ask you as we wrap up, What are you confessing? What are you confessing? If someone were to ask you right now, are you going to go to heaven? Could you say, I am 100% sure sure I'm going to heaven. On what basis are you going to heaven? I have confessed Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as my Lord and Savior. I've trusted in his finished work alone. And because of that, God has forgiven me. God has imputed righteousness to my account and he has already given me eternal life that can never be taken away. Is that what you're trusting in? Is that what you believe? Have you publicly made those statements? Have you publicly been baptized? Are you regularly partaking of the Lord's Supper? Are you going out and sharing your testimony? That's what saved people do. Second question, are you abiding in the only gospel that saves? I'm not asking you if you prayed a prayer 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. I'm asking you right now, right now, can you say with a clear conscience, Jesus is my Christ. I trust in his person and his work alone. Can you say that? Are you abiding in that? Are you confident because you should know then You have eternal security and eternal life. Amen? Amen. Or as the choir sang earlier, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior, all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Would you join me? Would you become one of those confessing Jesus is the Christ? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word and the clarity of it. For those pastors around the country who are confused on this, would you please open their eyes? We grieve for their churches and the lies that they would be hearing. We pray, Lord, that you would use our church to reach many, many more people with this true gospel. That we would abide in it, we would rejoice in it, we would proclaim it, we would testify of it, and we would have the joy to watch you bring others to believe in it. 
Thank you for the promises we have in you. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.